Are you ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> nice. All right, so hi, I'm Dr. Nikita, Nikita Bizniak with the amazing Super Susan Chappelle. How are you doing today, madam? I'm doing amazingly well. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. It's, uh, we got a lot of weather here today going through uh, Vancouver, so it's been pretty wet mostly, but you know, enjoying the time and getting to spend a day with you is fantastic, right? Thank so. you for having me. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> all right. You're a busy man. <laughs> You're a busy woman. All right. So a couple of key things here. Susan is an expert in, well, maybe you should give people your background because a lot of people aren't aware. My background is as a therapist and a researcher. I've published extensively in post-surgical wound healing mechanisms as well as adhesion, adhesion formation in the abdomen, as well as a entrepreneur. I've been a businesswoman uh, with my own clinics for over 25 years now. Yeah, so a lot of clinical experience, a lot of research experience. Now we first met in Hawaii, and I couldn't. We were at a retreat there for a yoga re continuing education. Where retreat. he lifted me over his head <laughs> yeah, immediately. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wish she actually <laughs> I actually have a picture of it where she picked me up and held me up because she's the powerhouse here. So a couple of key things. What I was really struck by was the level of information that you have and the research that you've been involved in. Maybe you could explain some of that to us. Uh, thank you. That's the research that I've been involved in. All started basically from a questioning of the profession that I was in a little bit. I had an existential crisis, as many of us do in therapy. I basically uh, wondered what I was doing with my hands. When I pick up tissue, when I pull tissue, when I stretch tissue, if I'm pushing on somebody, what is going on at the cellular level that allows people to gain function, to uh, gain mobility, and to heal, basically, from the work that I was doing. So, as a result, I went into research. Yeah. So, tell us uh, some of the research that you've done then. I thought that's where I was most, most astounded by what she's actually accomplished. So, so I've published, um, I think it's around seven papers, all looking at mechanisms of abdominal adhesion formation or looking at. Uh, we did, we've done extensive work. We did uh, one project on neural regeneration, we did a project on breast cancer and lymphedema. We did a project as well. Uh, most of our projects have been looking at motility and mobility in the intestine system and how that relates the movement of tissue at the cellular level to the healing mechanism and the pain people experience when they've had uh, post-surgical care. All right, so now a lot of viewers out there, when, we, when they're reviewing this video, they're gonna be looking at it and saying, what are we actually talking about? What are we looking to go through? What are we really doing with our hands? So many people wanna say they're breaking adhesions or they're realigning muscle fibers or whatever else it is. Why don't you give us some enlightenment from your research, Susan? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a little bit of a rabbit hole you can go into. As a manual therapist, when we're working with patients, we love describing uh, what we're doing to our patients. We don't want to feel that our hands are just pulling and pushing. Uh, all manual therapies basically have the same mechanism of action. Okay. So whether you're moving tissue, pushing, pulling, uh, doing grade five, grade four mobilizations, the mechanism at the neurological level is still the same. So basically understanding for me what I was doing with my hands and integrating it with patient knowledge, the education that had to put, take place, uh, our research looked at cellular level mechanisms of inflammatory processes. All right. And what were the results of that research? The results of that research were that prevention is the best modality. So, <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Which is why Dr. Nick and I got along so well, because prevention really is everything. Making sure that your surfaces are gliding, making sure that your muscles are strong, and that you're in the shape that you should be in for your age, for your body type, uh, that your diet is good, but basically looking at inflammatory mechanisms. And when you look in that microscope and you see the effect of manual therapy is actually increasing or decreasing inflammatory process, uh, so let's just stop there for one second. Exactly. Let's make sure that everybody realizes that. So you're able to look under a microscope and see what inflammatory process is occurring inside of the tissue. Yes. Yeah, and that's one thing that we cannot see with our hands. You can't even really see it on a patient, right? So, that's right. Yeah. There's so many therapists that uh, talk about palpating inflammation. When inflammation is acute, any therapist can palpate that 
boggy feeling underneath the tissue to be able to look in the microscope and see what happens at the cellular level when you're pushing and pulling that tissue when it's inflamed versus when it's normal tissue is incredibly important. All right, so now I'm thinking of myself, I'm treating patients in clinic, you are as well. We're trying to figure out what is the actual mechanism of what we're doing. If you were to relate it down to maybe, I don't know, two or three things, what are the key things that you're actually doing with your treatments? I'm taking an analysis of where that patient is in the healing process. And as you can see. Yes, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic, right? So as you can see above, the healing process is very uh, well established in the literature. So the mechanism of healing, if that patient is on day two of tissue healing as opposed to day 32, uh, the mechanism and how I'm going to treat that patient is incredibly different. All right, so elaborate on that. Like, How are we going to treat differently an acute injury, day two versus 32? So the acute injury, you want to just mobilize the tissue. You want to make sure it's not gluing together to, with other structures. You want to be incredibly gentle. You don't want to be at that place where you're integrating more inflammatory process into that tissue. You do want to acknowledge that that tissue may uh, be compressed or not have the proper nutrients that are required for healing, like macrophage infusion, for instance. And at the same time, that fibrin is laying in and going to be, uh, fibrin is very sticky. Yeah, we're kind of in this stage right here, exactly. right? It's very early stage. Yes. Yeah. All right. And you want to make sure that that tissue is gliding with other tissues and that you're not introducing more inflammatory process. All right, so how do you gauge that with a patient? Like, what is your, what is your go-to? Like, is it a th less than a three out of 10 on the pain scale? Because you're gonna work within their body. So what do, you, what do you use for your gauges there? It is pain scale. It's exactly pain scale. But, you know, uh, good pain versus bad pain. Yes, yes. I will also point that out, is that people's perception of pain can often be, uh, everybody's experience with pain is different. So I have patients that are incredibly sensitive where they have a sprained ankle and it's the end of the world, they don't want to walk on it, they can't, they're on crutches, they come into your clinic and they are not able to function at all. Uh, or in Squamish where I live where you have patients that break their ankle and want to get out on their mountain bike the next day. So lifestyle is an incredibly important thing to gauge. Pain is an incredibly important thing to gauge. Yeah, so we're basically following a biopsychosocial model of yes. overall healing, working specifically on the scar tissue that you're trying to influence optimally for that patient, Correct. right? And you have to take all of that into, into consideration. So how do you tell somebody the conversation of good pain versus bad pain? That's, the, you know, every patient is so different in their psychosocial uh, understanding of pain. And if a patient, you want to acknowledge people's pain. If people are in pain, that is their experience of pain. So you, by explaining to somebody that there is good pain versus bad pain, exactly that conversation, uh, but you don't want to take in a person who's in acute pain into more acute pain. And especially working with the abdomen area, you can increase the inflammatory process so much that you can immobilize that person the next day. They're never going to come back to your clinic again. So let's talk about that because you also do continuing education seminars on visceral mobilizations as well, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so what are some of the key features on those that you make sure to cover for your students who are involved with that process? It's, uh, you know, my courses are very hands-on. Uh, but also very didactic. We go through the literature on uh, the process and the mechanism of cellular level uh, things that are happening inside that patient's body while you're working on them. And then we basically explain to the therapist on how to work with that process. So somebody that's uh, two days post-surgery versus somebody yep. that's having chronic issues and has already developed neurological mechanisms that are giving them pain but as, I, as we've both said before, that pain signal could be just uh, neural sprouting into tissue, and I think that is an incredible point that we should cover. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that's what a lot of people aren't realizing. They're focusing so much on the fibroblast growth and all of this into the area that realistically you're looking at more of a neurologic sensitization in the that's area. That's right. Yeah, so maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that with your research. So uh, one of the papers that we covered was in a repetitive strain injury. Uh, model where the rats were given repetitive injuries by pulling levers repetitively until they couldn't anymore and then they would switch sides. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it is people are the same way. They will functionally, functionally 
move through their pain, and if there's a task that needs to be done, they will facilitate that task right through their pain. So we used to think that the tendon injuries were happening inside the tendon sheath, and as therapists, we would work on tendon sheaths. Now we understand through our published literature that pain actually happens in between surfaces. So as fiber lays in and sticks surfaces together... Let's just say that again. Make that statement again because it's crucial that people understand It is that. crucial understanding. Tendon sheets are there to protect the tendon and they're very effective at doing that. Adhesions can happen between to stop in extremely bad crush injuries. That can happen, but the majority of repetitive strain injuries or things that we're working on happen between superficial uh, surfaces and tendon sheets. All right, so excellent. All right, tell us more. This is, this is awesome. Like, I, just can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how good it is to have this research and to have such an expert here to talk about it. It's fantastic. It's so amazing mm -hmm. to be sitting with somebody that actually is curious enough to ask. Yeah. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, so that uh, the gliding, I get really excited if I'm loud for this video. Um, the surfaces that are gliding, when you don't have macrophage uh, infusion into a wound during the initial stages, and that tissue becomes very gummy with fibrin, and those surfaces end up sticking together and there's no movement, what happens is that the, ner the sensory nerves that are damaged end up trying to find their way back to their original tissue. So in that process, they sprout through the tissue, and sometimes those sprouts get stuck in between those sticky processes in between the tissue. So movement, mobility actually disrupts those sprouts uh, and the pain processes, substance P that gets yep. ejected into the tissue. Every time you move and you pull on that tissue, you're emitting a pain process, yep. which goes right back to good pain versus bad pain. Yeah, and even, even beyond that, when we're looking at the appropriateness of healing in this acute state injury, the person still has to move a little bit within their tolerance to help maintain those, fat, those planes of movement, right? Absolutely. So what we see, and I've, I'll show a cadaver video here in a second, but what we see in the cadaver lab is typically people will have something, for example, like a mastectomy that we're going to look at here. Standard protocols have been where they have their arms slung up and they don't move it around very much and that results in massive scar tissue formation and a very delayed healing process. What else does that lead to? What else does that lead to? Well, it leads to fibrous adhesions for sure and the layers and neuron sensitivity and right. decreased lymph lymphatic flow in the area. Like all that of it is gets the changed. point that I was going to make is that decreased lymphatic flow. We used to think about the lymph flow uh, often breast cancer patients who have had mastectomies will have sentinel node surgery and have lymphatic bundles taken out of their arms as well. So that fibrous adhesions that happen that gum up the lymphatic channels that create scar tissue can also lead to uh, ly lymphedema down the arm. Yeah, and then of course all the other negative outcomes that we associate with that, even complex regional pain syndromes, yes. all of that can be associated in those areas, right? And the so. medications as well, so this goes back to treating your patient where they're at, is basically the full uh, understanding what medications they're on. Some of those me medications can cause neuropathies and uh, neural sensitivity. Uh, radiotherapy as well, so if they've had a mastectomy, some may or may not have to go through radiotherapy, but the radiotherapy that they do go through will be burning the tissue, which also causes fibrosis. All right, Susan, so when we were at this amazing retreat in Hawaii that we did together, one of the neat things that you brought up, we were talking about the healing processes. So I've created this graph of, out of uh, meta-analysis research review here. And I'm going through talking about how muscles heal, how ligaments heal, how bone heals. And there's going to be varying degrees on that, but I couldn't believe how much information you had on this, how different tissues heal at different rates. That's right. Yeah, so tell us maybe a little bit more about that, those healing rates and what we're looking at. So it's... Uh we can take a look at, so in that beginning healing process where all those cells are infusing, the, there's so much going on in all healing processes. But when you have highly vascular tissue, you, have neuro, you don't just have neurogenesis, but you also have vascular tissue that is sprouting at the same time and yeah. trying to heal. So your so angiogenesis is all taking place in the, same, exactly. the same process. Yeah. So angiogenesis happening at the same time as neurogenesis. Um, when you have bone fractures, uh, the amount of compression that happens in the area and swelling that prevents your periosteum from healing, uh, bone fractures heal quite well. Periosteum, not so much. Mm -hmm. So when you look at bone fractures healing, mobility is the same thing. Mobility increases vasculature to the area. 
Yeah, and that's contraindicated to what a lot of people think. They believe you have a broken bone, you shouldn't move it at all or do anything with it, and you see this rigid cast for six weeks. Well, we know the atrophy and negative outcomes that occur with that. Now, you're not going to go take your broken arm and move it around, but if you go look on YouTube and type in Visniac fracture screen, I show you two patients with broken upper limbs, and for both of them, the treatment was soft casting or even just sling, and it was a comminuted fracture in the middle of the humerus, and you still would move that limb around, just like you would have done in prehistory before we came up with these amazing... When we Armed. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you would have moved around a little bit and that would have given you optimal healing, right? I call it farmer healing. Yeah, yeah, excellent. That's, that's exactly that's exactly what it is. A step back to more minimalistic approach yes. to these processes. The minimal effective dose. What is the least you have to do to make, make yourself get better or make somebody else get better? That's what we're looking at here, right? That's entirely true. Minimal, uh, minimal intervention as well, but when we look at this sort of fracture where you have a humeral head that's actually knocked off, unless something is pinned, uh, if something is slightly fractured or spiral fractured, movement actually encourages healing. When you have things that are pinned together, and this goes for ligaments or muscle or ligaments and other tissue, is that oftentimes when cells have to proliferate to make something heal together, that's when you want to reduce movement. That doesn't mean reducing movement in all the peripheral joints, it means reducing the movement so that your two surfaces can heal together. Yeah, That's very important. Yeah, so basically a surgical gap closure has to occur if things are too far apart, but there Correct. becomes a point where you reach this point of diminishing returns and might even have negative contra uh, side effects from it as well. So That's right. Yeah. And the best tissue to look at negative outcomes is with uh, people moving too quickly when it comes to ligament healing. Ligament healing, if you've had an avulse ligament that needs to reattach to an attachment point and you've had surgery to reattach this ligament, or tendon, you have to allow enough cells to proliferate in that area to actually attach it to the surface because these are very tensile strength yeah. uh, structures that need to be able to heal with time and little energy. That's right, and I can't tell you how accurate that is. If you're looking at the current research, well, what is the treatment for an Achilles tendon rupture? It used to be surgical intervention was the standard of practice. Now you're looking at more let it heal on its own and adhere to the other tissue around that's going to adhere in to develop the similar or better outcomes compared to surgical interventions in the vast majority of cases. So Correct. Excellent. All right, anything else you want to add with this fantastic research you have here? I feel like I just want to reach ah. in and pull, pull all the information out as much as I can. So, yeah. That's, there's so much to talk about. And those are, I think we've covered basically most of the, uh, you'll have to rewind this many, many times to, yeah. well, <laughs> we, even, we, even, we both talk quickly. Absolutely. And we both are very <laughs> excited about yeah. dealing. Well, even if you look at this graph, this is the simple version of this graph. The real version that I put in the books actually has a third level where I show which cells come in at what time and stuff like that, right? And that's what you really want to pay attention to because that directly dictates our treatment regimes for a patient and what we're going to advise them on, so. That's right, and we're working on a chapter together that will be published shortly that will explain every single tissue and every healing mechanism that is possible. All right, fantastic, Susan. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming in here Thanks today. for having me. All right, good stuff. One of those, fantastic. <laughs>